lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Okay. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, one of the believers had the question, did the apostles promote socialism since they shared all things according to Acts 2.44? Okay, let us understand this in its context of the book of Acts. As we pointed out various times, there are at least three major models of ecclesiastical polity and church government and church structure in the book of Acts. You only find this being practiced at the primordial church in Jerusalem. You don't find it being practiced in Antioch or in the Greek churches. It was something that was done in the beginning for a very good reason. Something was taking place and something was going to come into play prophetically as predicted by Jesus and Daniel that the believers in Israel and in Jerusalem needed to be reminded about in the epistle to the Hebrews later on. What am I saying? Say you lived in um, uh, Omaha, Nebraska. If Jesus Christ came to you in Omaha, Nebraska, and Jesus Christ personally said, Omaha is going to be obliterated. It's going to be completely destroyed. Get ready to leave town. Get ready to get out of here. Don't try to make a permanent home. It's going to get wiped out. Similar to what happened to Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be destroyed. Get ready to get out of here. If Jesus told you that, wouldn't you put your house on the market really quick? <laughs> They were getting in a lifeboat to be rescued, which, as we've explained in our books, such as our page, that was a type of the rapture when the believers left under the cousin of Jesus, Simeon, following the martyrdom of James before Titus destroyed Jerusalem. So they knew what was going to happen. Jesus told them the whole place was going to be obliterated. They were only there for a certain fixed amount of time to get ready to leave. That is one of the reasons the Lord allowed the martyrdom of Stephen, to get them used to this idea, Jerusalem is not going to be permanent in its present state. It will be restored, but it's also going to be destroyed, as Daniel prophesied and as Jesus predicted. That is the background. The place was facing obliteration. Now, to get the church going, as it were, there was a communal lifestyle. But to take one instance out of the book of Acts and to try to make a template out of that, or to try to argue that the New Testament teaches socialism as the biblical norm, this is ridiculous. You see no reference to this kind of living in Antioch or in Corinth or in Ephesus. It was for a specific place at a specific time for a specific reason. Now, I go to places where the church is persecuted. I go to certain countries where there's persecution. We don't put a lot of publicity into it for obvious reasons, but Moriel is active in certain countries. <coughs> the situation is not all that much different sometimes today. I go to a place where there's pastors of a particular tribe being brutally persecuted. All of them have been, been imprisoned and things like this. Some of them have been tortured. And they're all sleeping on the floor on straw mats, eating little rice from a cup with chopsticks. And it, uh, I'll say it one time in, in, in Vietnam. They still live like that. I go to places where Christians still live like that, but they live like that for the same kinds of reasons. The circumstances in which they find themselves dictate its necessity. And so the Holy Spirit leads them to survive that way, because if they didn't, they wouldn't survive. Now, this does remind us that everything we have belongs to Jesus. And there will be times in the last days when we have to be ready to live that way should the need arise, as some Christians still do. That was the case in Jerusalem. 
the city was anyway under a death sentence. They had the prophecies of Daniel 9, the Messiah would come, the temple would be destroyed. Jesus told them the destruction was coming. It came in 70 AD. They had one generation to get everything built up as well as they could to get out of there. And it happened. That is the background. You cannot say that the New Testament promotes socialism or capitalism or feudalism. The principles of the gospel transcend any socioeconomic model. They transcend anyone. Now we can go further with this. John Wesley, who was one of my personal heroes of the faith, taught, make all you can so you can give all you can. In other words, he was saying something capitalistic, make all you can so you can be philanthropic and give it away, something socialistic. But it was voluntary. It was never compulsory. It was as the Lord led you. You cannot misuse the New Testament to lend credence to any socioeconomic or political model per se. The principles of scripture can come into play in all of those models. And when any of those models are permeated by scriptural influence, they will function better and more honestly. But you cannot equate scripture with any socioeconomic model, and certainly not socialism, uh, forced redistribution. We'd also point out that the Jerusalem model was not a welfare state as we see today. It was not a welfare state. Paul goes on elsewhere to warn, if people don't work to support their families, they're worse than a pagan, they're worse than an unbeliever. The idea that instead of having a husband and a father, you have food stamps. Well, this is a socialistic idea, but it's not a biblical idea. In Great Britain, after the Second World War, everything had been destroyed by the Luftwaffe, by the German Air Force, everything, the infrastructure of Great Britain was leveled. The welfare state was designed by someone called Sir William Beveridge, and the idea of the British welfare state initially was we have to take care of single parent families, but what was a single parent family? It was a woman with children whose husband was killed in the war against the Nazis or against the Japanese. He drowned in the North Atlantic in the Merchant Navy, the Merchant Marine, or he was killed in the Royal Air Force or killed on the Normandy beaches or something like this. It was a war widow with children. So the philosophy was, as a Judeo-Christian nation, we have a moral obligation to help these war widows and their children. The state, the state and the taxpayer must assume some, some of the social and financial obligations of these children who have no father and of the widow who's left with these kids because her husband was killed in the war defending Britain from the Nazis, from the Imperial Japanese, and so forth. That's what a single parent family was. Now a single parent family is a young woman with five kids from three different unemployed yobos, and the taxpayer gets the bill. You have the same thing in the United States. In the late 1940s, under the worst days of Jim Crow and the injustices of racism in the American South, fewer than one out of 10 Afro-American children were born out of wedlock. Now that they've turned against the faith of their parents and grandparents, three out of four African-American children are born out of wedlock, and Hispanics and Caucasians are catching up. There's a moral breakdown of the society. This is facilitated by socialism, by food stamps. Not legitimate use of food stamps for by a war widow or something. <coughs> you know, <coughs> Just and not to be political, but under Obama, the number of black Americans on food stamps has gone up by 58%. They've created a permanent dole, a permanent welfare state. Now, some people have tried to associate this with Christianity. These left-wing liberation theology people like Jeremiah Wright, it has no scriptural basis. The New Testament teaches if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. If you don't take care of your wife and kids, you're worse than an unbeliever. You're worse than a pagan. 
the fact that society has gravitated away from its biblical origin, its biblical constructs, and that governments in Britain and America and other countries have basically departed from the Judeo-Christian heritage, and the, and, and the courts are dictating this. The courts are legislating this from the bench, forcing people to, to, to divorce their values or their, the practical expression of their values from the moral foundations of society as taught in scripture. The fact that this is happening uh, is an outrage, but it is happening because of the moral breakdown of society. What is really tragic, what is really revolting, what is really reprehensible, however, is that you have left-wing pseudo-theologians, left-wing pseudo-preachers, the Jeremiah Wrights of this world, who try to justify it on the basis of distorting the Word of God. No, the Word of God does not teach socialism. It does not teach any ism. It teaches Jesusism. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you.